Yo, yo, what is up? What is up? We are two days away from the NBA draft, and I got the whole crew in the building today. And this is going to be just a round robin of questions. We're going to try to stump each other with draft questions and just pick each other's brains about the 2022 NBA draft. Stay tuned. Or you are listening to the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, which is your daily NBA draft podcast. I'm Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies.com. I think I'm a little bit biased about this crew that I have with me. I think it's the best draft crew out, period. And that's because I got my man Sam Ferris, aka the intelligent one. I got Leaf Tulane, a.k.a. the grinder, the man that says he watched more college basketball than anybody else. And then there is the clip god himself, Richard Stamen, who is known for putting out all the clips of all the top prospects. All right, just just open question. Two days before the draft, who do you think is going to be the biggest riser and faller? I'll start with you, Sam. The biggest riser, I'll go with... Jalen Williams out of Santa Clara. I think he has a chance to sneak into the end of the lottery. I know we've talked about him before. He's a guy that's moved up from potential second round pick. I think he's certainly a lock to be a first round pick, but come draft night, I would not be surprised if Jalen Williams ends up going somewhere from like the 13 to kind of 17, 18 range. In other words, I think top 20 is certainly a possibility for him. Um, so I think he's going to be a riser and then a faller on draft night, because I think there's a lot of like combo guard types, um, whether it's a tie tie Washington, a Blake Wesley, we can go on and on a lot of guys there. So I think there's a chance that Jaden Hardy might be a bit of a faller on draft night. He was a late invite into the green room on draft night. Um, but I could see him going you know, last five picks of the first round, potentially into the second round. So I think he's a guy that might end up falling a little bit on draft night. Yeah, I, I heard, I posted it in the article that um, a scout told me he doesn't think Jalen Williams falls past Atlanta. And then and the same scout had mentioned that he said if he thinks that Ty Ty Washington could be the last guy left in, in the green room. Leaf, who, okay. who's your biggest riser? In your opinion, I was going to go with Jalen Williams as well. Uh, I think I think he's the the guy that rose and helped himself the most at the combine. And athletically, I posted a fun fact just a moment ago on Twitter that Jalen Williams and Donovan Mitchell are the only two players to have the wingspan be one point one six above their their height. Um, to have a 33 and a half inch vertical um, and, and more, and then run a sprint at a certain speed. And I think he was also the best player at the combine. You could make an argument for Traquavion Smith, but he didn't stay in the, in the draft. So I'd go with Jalen Williams. If I had to choose another one, I might go with Dalen Terry. I think Dalen Terry can up some steam as a defensive minded guard that will um, share the ball. And I think a lot of teams want that. And then as the faller, I would go with Ty Ty Washington. I don't have another one that's particularly on my mind, but I think that was the the one, the guy that seems to be falling based off workouts that I'm hearing steam of. What, what about you, Richard? Highest riser, biggest faller. Yeah, I feel like it's cheating to say Jaden Ivey because I could see him going up to number two. And most people have dismissed that anybody outside of Paolo, Jabari, and Chet in some order will go number two. So he's a candidate, but I'm going to go with someone a little bit bolder. Uh, I'm going to say Usman Jang. I think he could go all the way up to number eight. Um, I, I really think the Pelicans are a fit for him. You know, there's Dyson Daniel smoke there, but I think Usman Jang fits a little bit better, not only just as a fit being a little bit more off ball, similar defense, but I think he also has higher upside as a creator. And I, I just, I buy into him uh, uh, given the value of the wing position. Cause I don't see Dyson Daniels as a wing. I think he's a point guard. So a little bit different there, but I think he fits really well for Fowler. There's two guys for me that really stand out. I, I talked all draft season about it. Tari Eason. I've heard bad uh, workouts, interviews, things like that from him, from uh, sources about him. So I could see him sliding into the twenties. And then another one, Jaden Hardy, same kind of thing, just, uh, 
awareness in this process has been lacking from him, from what I understand. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard with Hardy that um, the reason why he may fall is because some teams think he can only guard one position and only play one position. And a scout told me he feels the same about Johnny Davis. Johnny Davis could be a faller on draft night because they don't think that he can play three. They think he's strictly a two. For me, I'd say the biggest riser, I'd say Jang has a chance. I think when he said he won't let people know, he won't mention the teams that he's worked out for. I think that means that um, he's probably worked out for somebody high that he's probably not mocked to go to. And then a guy that I think could be the biggest faller is Kendall Brown. We're talking about a guy who I, at one point I thought was a top five pick, top 10, and he didn't get invited to the green room. And I think that means something. If all 30 teams vote and you aren't in the green room, that means they don't see you as a possibly top 20 pick, which, I mean, of course, we've seen before. Some guys are in the green room for a long time, but it's it's uh, very interesting because he was definitely somebody that most people were really high on at the beginning of the season. All right, Sam, it's on you. You got to pick a person and you got to ask them the question All right. and burning the ass. <laughs> I got my questions queued up here. So I'll pick Richard, aka Mavs draft. So when we look at the best shooters in this draft class, for me, when looking at guys at the top, I've got Jabari Smith. I've got AJ Griffin. I don't know if you have that exact order, but uh, give me one or two other guys in the first round that you would throw in that mix in terms of looking at the top three or four shooters in this draft class. Yeah, I might put Oche Agbaji above AJ Griffin just because I think he's a little bit better at movement threes and also just uh, I, I think I trust his range more and also translating right away, quicker shot. The, the base is just really weird with AJ Griffin. I think he's third though, uh, that being said. So, you know, uh, he's somebody who I see as a great shooter. I think somebody who has gotten really underrated as a shooter might be in this conversation um, is Wendell Moore. He's a guy who his first two years at Duke, I know he's starting to be a little bit of a, a darling to draft Twitter, but in his first two years, at Duke, his first year, he wasn't even draft eligible, but he wasn't very confident as a shooter. This year, the confidence grew. He needs to take more contested shots and make more contested shots, but still made, I think, 39 or 40 percent from three on guarded shots per synergy. Uh, the next step really is shooting off the dribble. He doesn't have that. And if you're looking for one more uh, a first round guys, it gets actually gets a little bit thin here. I, I am having a hard time with this one. I'll go, uh, actually, no, I'm not. I, I just completely forgot the top of the draft. Benedict <laughs> Matherin. I don't know how on earth. I, I was like, all right, 10, 11, 12. Benedict I was waiting Matherin for that. It's awesome. Uh, I, I have a number on my board, but apparently I'm overlooking him <laughs> myself. I really trust his ability to hit pump fake threes. Like, I mean, the same way Desmond Bain shoots threes, it's nothing crazy, but he's just elite at hitting the simple shots. I feel like Keegan Murray is an underrated shooter. Shot 39% from three on a decent volume of attempts, but his name isn't mentioned as one of the top shooters when, you, when most people break it down. Leaf, you watch a lot of college basketball. Do you agree or do you feel like he's not in that same category as the other guys? I think he's a set shooter. So I think the difference between like Matherin or maybe AJ Griff, Jabari is very different because he shoots it with his body, all sorts of different angles facing the rim. But the way Murray shoots is very much catch and shoot. And I think if it's just catch and shoot from, from the corners, the wings, his top of the key numbers aren't bad either. Um, I think he's in that conversation. I think the potential to be a, like a game change, like the defense change game plan uh, to guard his shooting I think he's not quite in that conversation but in terms of catch and shooting I think he is in that conversation and I think one more if, if I can insert one is uh, is Malachi Branham I think Malachi Branham can really shoot the ball and the question for him is if he elects to shoot a lot of threes rather than his mid-range game but his splits were about 50 40 41 and 84 as a freshman at Ohio State in a defensive oriented Big Ten so I think that's one more guy that I think may surprise people where he gets picked because of the shooting prowess that he show in workouts at forced to shoot the three and teams will just have to change his shot chart a little bit yeah I've heard that's been one of the the issues in his workouts and it may be this particular workout that I heard about was that he was passing up open threes to take contested shots and and uh, he was just reluctant shooter, which is, you know, something that was kind of consistent with 
how he shot during the the regular season because he favored the the mid range as opposed to the three point shot. All right, when we return, it's on you, Leaf. You get to ask the question, but I have to let the audience know that one live NBA draft show is not enough for Locked On. Every show is going live on draft night. So join whoever your favorite team is, whether it's Locked On Mavs, Locked On Magic, Locked On Knicks, Lakers. No, Lakers don't have a pick. Neither do Mavs, but I hear they're both trying to buy into the draft. So whoever your favorite team is, 15 minutes before their pick, go to YouTube to get the immediate reaction from your local expert. Subscribe now to Locked On NBA, of course, the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, and whoever your favorite team is, so you will know when they go live. Once again, this is Rafael Barlow with my whole crew, the best draft guys in all of draft Twitter, draft podcast world. Got the whole crew in the building today. Leaf Tulane, it is up to you to pick one of us, and you got to ask the tough question. All right, I'm, I'm going to go to Sam because we haven't spoken as much about this as, as a, the other rest of us. So, Sam, what to you differentiates Benedict Matherin and A.J. Griffin? Because we talked about them both as elite shooters and say five years down the road, uh, which I think is the first time you can really check in on these prospects as to how successful they are. Uh, what paths do you see for these guys and what differentiates them for you? Yeah, you got me with the tough question. Back to back, I've got them seven and eight on my board in the same tier. And so I view them similarly and I th- I have a hard time differentiating kind of their future. But to me, the most obvious point right now is just the functional athleticism. Matherin's the better athlete and that's why, frankly, I, I've got him one spot higher. So not a huge difference. But the question with Thay Griffin is, you know, to what extent does the athleticism returned to him after uh, the dislocated knee that he had in high school. And then he had a few setbacks at Duke too, was kind of late coming to the party, had to fit in there. Um, So I really love AJ Griffin as a shooter. I loved him coming in. I love his physical profile, but the question is on the deep side of the ball. And then as well as the ability to attack closeouts, that is going to hinge a lot on what level you know, when he goes in, works with a strength and conditioning staff in the NBA, can they get uh, that athleticism that he was at pre-Duke and pre-injury back? And to me, if that is the case, then I would prefer A.J. Griffin, but that's just kind of the question mark. And so to me, a little bit of the safer answer is probably Benedict Matherin. All right, it's on you, Richard. Man, I wanted to ask Sam something, but we I don't want to go back to back to back on him. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, go he, ahead. he is the Fire intelligent away. one. He's the I'm going to keep going one. at you. So, uh, <laughs> actually, not going at you. It's more of I kind of just want confirmation by us when we get to this. But, <laughs> but there was an episode you had with Raphael about two or three months ago uh, mm-hmm. where you pointed out J.D. Davison's turnover rate and a bunch of other stats being like incredibly difficult to overcome. J.D. Davidson is no longer a first-round pick, maybe not even a draftable pick. So I'm curious, who in the first round stands out as a major red flag, don't draft them because of something in the stats? Whether it's, uh, and I know, sorry, before you answer, I know you've talked in the past about how upperclassmen, generally when their breakouts happen, it can be fool's gold. So just curious about your thoughts. Yeah, so I'll start with your first, or your second question. Um, I do look at it like that. And David Locke just kind of uh, messaged us on Twitter and asked about a guy like Jalen Williams. And the way I usually look at it is if you're a legit first round, especially a lottery level prospect, I want to see the breakout within the first two years in call. It just seems like if you're going to be anything more than a role player in the NBA, uh, you usually see certainly hints of that before the junior year. Now there's always going to be exceptions, but I think that's generally the case. That's why I've been lower on guys like Davion Mitchell, Corey Kispert last year. I think they tend to top out as role players at the next level. If a guy really has, you know, high end upside as an offensive player, you're going to see hints of that either their first or second year. And so that's why I have not overreacted personally to Jalen Williams basically skyrocketing up boards. That's why I still have him as like a late first round pick because that's where I had him all along. Uh, I'm not 
overly wane the combine in that regard. So that's one example uh, that I'll hit on. And if we want a topic of older players, Ochai Baji for the same reason, is a guy that I have. I have him 24th on my board, and I did the Lockdown Wizards podcast, and he asked me, you know, does Ogbaji have any off-the-bounce potential, or is he more so just a spot-up guy? And digging into the, into the synergy profile on him, even as a player that's been in college as long as he has, he only had, I think, 12 isolation possessions all of last season. So even... Uh, as a seasoned vet at Kansas, he wasn't asked to play off the bounce. I think if you're drafting him, he's going to shoot it because spotting up to me is really is going to be as good as you can expect from him. I just don't really see much more out of him outside of like a fourth or fifth starter offensively. So those are two examples that I think I would point at. Guys that have risen be produced later on in their career, but I didn't consider them to be great prospects as freshmen or sophomores. And so for me, that's why I'm hesitant to have the uh, inside the top 50, 20 on my board. Richard, in five years, who will be the top five players in this draft class? Oh man, it's never the top five. So I don't even, I'm not, I'm going to just go away from my board real quick, because I know for a fact it will not be the same five I have on my board, which is generally who I see being the top five picks, which is a death wish. But I'm going to say in some order, I think Paolo Boncaro and Jabari Smith are for sure there. Who knows what Chet, what will happen with Chet. Uh, I want to put him there. Um, I would say I'm going to put two dark horses, though, the rest of the way. I, I could see Ivy being like sixth. Just want to preface that. Um, I think there's two guys that – could really stand out. One of them is Benedict Mather. I have him fifth on my board, so I'm very, very excited for him. I think he has a ton of growth, assuming he can ever develop something of a handle, but I'll go with an absolute deep sleeper because there's always a deep sleeper that returns top five value, it feels like. So for me, and I know I'm preaching to the choir uh, with you, Raphael, but Ryan Rollins, the kid just screams like a, a Donovan Mitchell story in a way. I, that's somebody who I think both of us have been top 20 on consistently the whole process. Dude just needs kind of a spotlight to be seen and never really got it because he didn't make the tournament. But I think Ryan Rollins would be the other one for me. All right, Leaf. All right. Who, who, who I, I are you picking on? Okay. Oh, so my question. Um, yep. Let's see. I, I would be curious to see who the best five perimeter defenders are and i'll ask you rafael you haven't even answered any questions in a little while so yeah, the top five switchable perimeter defenders um i guess you can go with jabari chet dyson daniels i think ushman jang has, has the potential he has the physical tools and then i would say i know i'm gonna miss somebody but i would say maybe dale and terry uh, my question is, and I'll go back to Richard, give me somebody that you could see being a legit small ball five option down the road. So a guy that's not the center right now, but you think, you know, four years from now in the playoffs, a guy that can slide down, play the small ball five. Yeah, I'll give two ones at the top draft one, somebody who could be a sleeper, um, I'll start with Keegan Murray. I think there's going to be lineups where he pretty much plays the five. Uh, you know, there's a really fun stat out there. It doesn't actually mean a ton, but it is just really cool. And that is that like Keegan Murray had more games with the block than Walker Kessler had. Uh, Walker Kessler was the number one shot blocker in the country, historic shot blocker. So I thought that was really impressive. I think he can protect the rim a little bit. You probably want him as a help side guy. So how much? Can you play him at the five? But I think in certain lineups, it makes it work. And especially offensively, it's a big mismatch. Second one, this one's probably a little bit bolder. Uh, and Rafael, one of your guys, so correct. Just stop me if you think this is off base. But Jake Warabia is somebody who, when I first started scouting him, I thought he was like 6'10". So I was scouting him as a power forward center. And I was like, holy crap, this guy is like a perfect small ball five. And then I looked at his height. He's like, what, 6'8", six, 6'7 six, and a half, something like that. I still think he could qualify. I think he's got enough post skill, for example, to be a five offensively. And I, I know the length 
really limits the chances of being a small ball five, but just his play style on defense, I think he can move over and do that. The basketball IQ is so strong for him that I think he could maybe uh, squeeze into that role occasionally. That would be fun to watch. I mean, I think it would take a really, really creative coach to unlock that. How many creative coaches do we have in the NBA? I mean, I think Nick Nurse is one. But, I mean, there's a few guys that, that I feel like if there was a really creative coach, he could really just get the most out of, out of the guys. And one of my examples, and I wrote about it today, was Darion Sebron. And I would love to see how – I would love to see him in a situation like how when Don Nelson turned Marquise Daniels into a point guard. I don't know if people remember, but Marquise was undrafted, and Nash got hurt, and then he put up like almost a triple-double – Then they played small ball with Antoine Walker and Marquise went from undrafted to a six year, $38 million contract within like a calendar year. And he went on to play like 10 years, but it's like, if Don Nelson doesn't give him that opportunity to play point and he, I think he averaged 15 points per game in the playoffs that year, we could be talking about a different story. So there's a few guys that I think like a creative coach could unlock some, some different skills and Jake at a small ball center or something that I didn't really think about. All right, when we return, I have some more questions, but let's talk about prize picks. Now, if you are looking for a daily fantasy option for the NBA, then you need to try the award-winning app, Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. I love it, and I believe you will too. And with Prize Picks, all you have to do is pick two to five players and the over or under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times any entry, and it is just you versus the projected numbers. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Price picks is safe and it offers fast withdrawal so you can get your money out pretty fast. Just use your word winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. Price picks offers any prop you can think of from point score to rebounds and even steals. And what makes prize picks different is you can pick the over on player like LeBron or the under on Tom Brady. And prize picks doesn't just offer NBA, they have options on college basketball, college football, NFL, Major League Baseball, soccer, MMA, and more. And I again, I can't reiterate how Prize Picks does the mixed sports entries that just kind of makes it different and separates it from some of the other daily fantasy sports. For a limited time, Prize Picks has an exclusive no-brainer of an offer for all of our users. Users will get $50 free if a player in your first Prize Picks entry scores a single point, but you have to use the code NBA. That is right. This is an exclusive offer just for Locked On fans. Sign up today. Use the code NBA, and you'll get $50 free. And if a player in your first prize picks entry scores a single point, $50 in your account. Once again, this is the Locked On NBA Big Board Crew. Who is the guy that is not projected as a first-round pick that you believe when it's all said and done, is going to bring first-round value to a team. If you had to take one guy that's projected second round, and you say, I know this guy is, one of the, is going to be one of the top 25 or 30 players in this class when it's all said and done. Okay. So there are guys that I think have a higher ceiling, but a guy that I'm confident in returning top 25 value is Christian Brown out of Kansas. So I actually, I think it's really close between he and Agbaji, but my analytics and the stuff that I do liked him better as a prospect earlier in his career. And I think he's better attacking closeouts and doing kind of the ancillary things offensively, whether it's just making the right pass off of two dribbles. I think his functional athleticism is actually really, really good. I think he's going to be a solid defender at the next level guarding twos and threes. So in terms of upperclassmen that I'm, hi- that I'm higher on than consensus, Christian Brown would probably be that for me. Now, there are other guys, again, that I could pick that I think have a higher ceiling, but I do believe that, you know, I just have that confidence that he will return top 25 value. So I'll go with Christian Brown there. Leaf, I'll throw it to you. When we look at the Big Ten standouts last year, two sophomores come to mind, Johnny Davis, Keegan Murray. Uh, Which of those is going to finish higher on your board and why? 
this is, this is a slam dunk one for me because I'm lower on Johnny Davis than, than most. Um, I, and Keegan Murray, I've got, I've got him at number six right now. And Johnny Davis, let me check my latest board. Like 16 last time I saw. And he's still at 16. So there, there were updates today, but he, he remains at 16. <laughs> and, and, the, and the rationale, the rationale is that I think Keegan Murray plays a very projectable role. In, and I think he can score up to about 18, 20 points fairly early in his career as a three and D and maybe get some isolation uh, value as being like a second option, third option on a solid team. I think, especially with the teams that are picking around that five through seven range that he's got some pretty complimentary fits. Obviously the Kings are gaining some traction as picking him. And I, I think the fit there is not bad either. Um, as for the Johnny Davis, which is probably what people are wondering here. I think his role um, is, is to score at Wisconsin. That's what he did very well. And he, and he elevated it, quite frankly, what was a pretty poor team to be the three seed in the NCAA tournament. And uh, I just don't see the way his game operates in the mid range scoring, uh, um, going over bigger. Uh, he's bigger than most guards and he's scoring over smaller guards down low with floaters, touch shots. I don't see him having the opportunity with, with any team, except for maybe the wizards, that he could he could get those opportunities to score in that function, and I'm I think there's a large adjustment for him to try to score as a three and D, which I kind of see his role being like that of a Josh Hart. So I, I'm a lot higher on Keegan Murray than I am on Johnny Davis. I think Johnny Davis takes more of a unique fit than Keegan Murray, so Keegan Murray is more projectable for me. Uh, I'll go send one to Richard. Uh, Richard. Uh, uh, what is a player? Uh, you you have a few guys that I think you you're trending the opposite way than the consensus, and, and some of them I agree, some of them I not. That you think the consensus is low or high on that you feel the opposite on, and, and give a rationale as to why you feel like correct. Well, you know we have to hit our Jeremy Sohan for the day. Uh, I think we're now on what's the count of Raphael? Like seven straight episodes with me and you on that, that I say something negative about Jeremy Sohan. You know, I, he's, I uh, he's been, been in Dallas, right? So you stay away from. <laughs> Dude, he's going to see me. He's going to be like, sir, are you mouse track? And then just like, I'm going to get one like square in the face, something like <laughs> his people it'll, talk to me. It'll, like, it'll be his talk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, uh, so in case you couldn't tell Jeremy Sohan, somebody who I, I remain lower on, I think the jump shot is a bit of a fatal flaw. And I just don't think he's athletic enough on the offensive end to really make teams pay. Even if he's like 30% from three, I don't think he can make teams pay on closeouts uh, like over committing. So I remain low on him. That's, that's my whole shtick. By uh, any I chance. One in, uh, I, I wanted to ask, did you see the comments on the YouTube video? When, when we, we talked about him, it was a whole thread. I'm going to be real. Yeah. I they, don't were, they were saying like, you don't watch Baylor basketball. I mean, some people agreed, but you know, some people were just like, no, what do you I, mean? I he's not agree. athletic. Do you watch Baylor basketball? And so on. <laughs> See, and that's not what I even said. I said, he's not athletic as a, like offensively because he's so athletic on defense. Like it's clear as day, but he's a two foot leaper on offense. Like he doesn't really explode to the rim. Like I thought he does in warmups, but in game, he just doesn't do it. Uh, so that was really weird to me. I, I've been to Baylor games. I went to one this year, actually. So I, I definitely watched. But Raphael, if I can get one quick one into you, this is your forte. I got to hit you. Uh -oh. There are 14 players, I believe, I think was the number that were international early entrants for this year. It was a high number. Who is the one player nobody knows that gets taken in the second round? And everybody's like, who? And gets a draft and stash comes over eventually. That nobody knows? You know why that's a tough question? Because... I think you guys are going to know, but I think the average fan is not going to know. So I don't think there's a Perfect. name that I can say that the people that really follow the draft know that's going to be surprising. But there was one last year, and it was – I can't pronounce his name. Uh, and I, he's came on my podcast before. Um, the, he's from Greece. He was the 60th pick in the draft, Georgios Kalakadis. And he got drafted at 60, and – I felt like I was the only person that knew who he was, but there was a little bit of home cooking there because he got drafted by the Bucks at 60. He's represented by Octagon, same agent as Giannis. He's also Greek, but he didn't stick. I forgot who they um, ended up uh, cutting him for, but he ended up with the Thunder in their G League team, which is, I mean, if you've seen the Thunder's G League roster, I mean, even like their senior team, it is, it is international flavor everywhere. Uh, but I don't know if there's anybody this year that would 
be the unknown that I haven't talked about a, a bunch of times. But I would say, like, for the average fan, if they see Mateo Spaniolo drafted, they're going to be like, who is he? Same thing for Gabriel Prashida. I think both of those guys could could end up being drafted. All right, I got one last question, but this is a rapid, rapid fire question for everybody. All right, so let me let me think who I want to go with first. All right, I'll, I'll start with I'll start with Richard. I'll go Richard Leaf and and Sam. It was the grin. The grin gave it away. <laughs> Caleb Houston or Patrick Baldwin Jr. Which Dude. one has success? Uh, I'm gonna say Caleb Houston. I, I have both in my fifties, um, but I I think Caleb Houston. He reminds me of old Vince Carter, and old Vince Carter was a useful player. He did two things on the court. He shot threes from a standstill and some pick and rolls with Brandon Wright. And he was really good at those pick and rolls with Brandon Wright. He's, he was a good pick and roll player in college and limited usage. He had two bigs that were really good at rolling in Dickinson and Diabate. I think he sticks with that. I'll go with both, actually. I, I think that's a, I think I, I have, Houston, I have a Baldwin higher than Houston. So if I had to choose, I'd go with Baldwin. Uh, I, I believe that his shot was so pretty. Uh, in the U19s and at the height it's hard to find someone who can shoot at that height it's such a coveted thing like you think of guys who can shoot on the move like that and you get like Kevin Herter's coveted and he's you know he's not even that great of a a player thus far but the reason he's coveted is because he can shoot at that height and he can be moving and shoot well I think both of them have that value and I think Patrick Baldwin did so at such an early age I think it's hard for him to not be able to regain that form and shoot well at a certain point. And once you're shooting well at 6'10", I think even if you're a defensive liability, uh, we found uh, room in the league for Davis Bertans to be a valuable commodity. And I think he's got more potential Bertans. So I'll go with uh, Baldwin. I do think Houston will be a solid player as well because he's, he's also very young. He reclassified up to Michigan. And I, and I think he'll be a solid player as well. I have uh, Baldwin at 34 and Houston at 40 on my board. Quick question. What did you think of Ben Wallace's form? Ben Wallace's, yeah, uh, I uh, it was I was pretty young for his, <laughs> but it was not pretty. His form was actually good. <laughs> it just didn't go. The in. results weren't pretty. The yeah. results weren't pretty. The results were awful. I'm not a Patrick Baldwin guy at all. I just, I just don't think unless he, I think unless he's a Duncan Robinson type shooter, I don't know what he brings to the table if the shot isn't isn't falling. And even at the U19s, he didn't shoot a good percentage they they looked pretty and I was actually talking to a scout about him today and and his exact words were he looks good and that's all he could say is he looks the part as far as physically but he was like he's not athletic he's he's big and he's like he can't shoot and, and so it, it's very interesting um you know because like you said I think he's being judged on what the look physically and the look of his shot All right, Sam, what is your thoughts? Caleb Houston, Patrick Baldwin Jr. Uh, Definitely Pat Baldwin for me. I got Pat Baldwin 20, so I'm on the higher range for him. And I have got Caleb Houston down at 45. So maybe it doesn't honestly make sense, but that's just how I view it to have that that amount of difference between the two. So I know I'm still one of the last ones that are clinging on to the Pat Baldwin bandwagon. I've seen people that have him higher. I can't get into the lottery for sure after what I've seen, but just the skill level is where I think people rate how big he is. He's like the same size as centers like Jackson Hayes and like bigger than Kevon Looney. So I know you don't buy the shot. Like to me, if he's got, I just buy the shot happening when it comes to the reps and the coaching that he's going to get at the next level. And if the shot doesn't come around, then he's not going to make it. But you could say that about like half the prospects in this class, right? So I buy it with him. I've got him 20 due to the size and shooting. And that's where I'm at with him. All right. One, one quick question. Have you guys heard anything about his workouts? I have not heard anything. And I even talked to a scout today and he's like, there's no news on him. And he was saying like, does that mean he's not getting workouts or does that mean that he may have a soft landing spot somewhere? But he was like, you haven't really heard anything about him at all. All right. Well, that wraps up this episode. 
Shout out to each and every person that has made the NBA Big World Podcast your first listen of the day. And thank you for this great crew. Now, I want you guys to tune in to the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft. The first picks have been in. Search now for the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft, and you can get over 50 insiders from the Odyssey Sports Experts and this crew right here on the Locked On NBA Big Board. The five episodes of the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft are underway. Make the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft your first listen of the day. I'm Rafael Barlow with my co-hosts, Leif Tuling, Richard Stamen, and Sam Ferris, and we are out.